good evening everyone uh, good to see you all uh, welcome welcome to iit gandhinagar and also to uh, kiran c patel center for sustainable development my name is ambika yadra i am a faculty in humanities and social sciences here at iit gandhinagar and uh, we this is part of the sustainability seminar series that we often uh, we frequently organize where we invite speakers from various fields in uh, environment and development on the aspects of uh, sustainable development and this is the first time i'm uh, meeting uh, thiasha uh, i came across um, her uh, award uh, on the internet and i looked up and i thought i i decided to invite her so thank you so much thiasha uh, thank, uh, thank you so much uh, dr aidarai for uh, the introduction the very generous introduction and also for inviting me and uh, this is actually the first time that uh, you know i'm interacting with a student community that is Uh, so called outside the so called circle of wildlife students that we generally interact with so thank you again iit gandhinagar and the kiransi patel uh, center for sustainable development for inviting this talk on the fishing cat okay. um just a moment i haven't fully introduced you i thought i'll let me do the formalities and then i will uh, yeah uh, uh, tiasha is a member of uh, iucn cat specialist group she is a member of uh, fishing cat conservation alliance Uh, a global cohort of experts working on fishing cat across range countries in 2010 uh, tiasha co-founded the fishing cat project which is the world's largest running research uh, running research and conservation project on uh, on the fishing cat in 2016 she received the nari shakti puraskar award the highest civilian award for women in india in the recognition of her conservation work in 2022 she received future for nature awards an international award given from the netherlands to further conservation uh, and research work on the fishing cat before i uh, you know pass a mic to you tiasha when i circulated this poster many of them asked that is it about fishing the cats that is that that's <laughs> fishing cats so i think there are students here who are you know largely from non ecological background non biological background and uh, and and a special welcome to all those who are joining us from outside iit gandhinagar and tiasha you will be uh, speaking for around uh, 40 45 minutes and they will take uh, questions uh, over right. to you tiasha thank you so much thank you so much uh, dr aidarai for the introduction and uh, you know just to start i would say that it's not only you know students of uh, who are outside ecology who doesn't know about the cats uh, it is actually uh, you know because it's a small cat it is lesser known it is less appreciated and many of us in the you know in the circle of wildlife also do not know much about that so not a problem uh, i'm here to talk about it uh, so to start off with i thought i could talk about uh, you know the uh, basically introduce the cat and then talk about what conservation approaches we could take what the problems are and therefore what conservation approaches we need to take to conserve this cat so thank you uh, for uh, you know inviting me again and uh, so without much uh, delay i'll just go to introduce the cat um so so basically the fishing cat is uh, a member of the cat family and uh, you know i often start with asking people to imagine what it would be uh, so suppose you imagine that the age of the world is 1 hour so cats would have come in just 5 seconds ago which means they are very recent newcomers into the planet um and which and within those 5 seconds there was a lot of you know geological events biogeographical events which were happening on the planet there was sea level rise fall continents getting disconnected and connected and because of that the cats rapidly diversified into 40 species now when we think of a cat a wild cat hunting we generally imagine them to be you know hunting on land so for the you know the the very famous cheetah for example you know hunting uh, herbivores on the land or the tiger taking down herbivores on the land so it's mostly land based events that we visualize when we think of wild cats lions for example so it is actually a little difficult to imagine them hunting in water and that is where the fishing cat is actually unique 
because you know out of these 40 species of wild cats because they evolved into these 40 species within a very small amount of time just 5 seconds imagine in the geological uh, age of you know time scale of the earth they are very similar in their behavior in their ecology in you know the way they look the way they walk for example so you know those of us who keep domestic cats as pets we often see them yawning and we think oh they you know they, they look like a tiger and that's because they're very similar and you know like i was saying they're mostly land predators except for two which which hunt in the so called semi aquatic niche which is you know in water uh, they hunt fish and one is the flat-headed cat which is endemic to southeast asia and the other is the fishing cat which is present in both south and southeast asia so just to answer those questions it is a cat which hunts fish and hence its name the fishing cat now when you hunt in the water there is there is there is a constant loss of energy mechanical energy when you are you know jumping into the water and hunting fish so to uh, basically circumnavigate the problem you might say that nature has cherry picked traits to aid the fishing cat so that it can thrive and colonize these wetlands so one of these are the you know is the double layered coat of the fishing cat and this is this acts like a waterproof fur which which keeps the skin underneath from getting wet um then they have this really interesting trait like a partially webbed feet we all know that ducks have webbed feet but here is a cat which has partially but but webbed feet and it has half retractile claws which means that uh, you know its claws are half jutting out all the time and these two traits actually help it to catch its primary prey which is the fishing cat from which it, its name is derived now we there was a recent uh, you know uh, study that we did to understand uh, the hunting strategy of the fishing cat and what we came to know or what we we came to uh, understand is that the fishing cat has evolved a unique hunting strategy to maximize its opportunities to hunt fish and which again goes back to state the importance of fish in the diet of fishing cat now remember this these are carnivores and cats are obligate carnivores cats are these hyper carnivores the meat eaters of the world and so prey is at the center at the core of the ecology of this species so it's therefore not an overstate might not be an overstatement to say that the, the you know the, the way the fishing cat behaves the way it lives its life it's all kind of or mostly centered around fish and um this finding that it has evolved this unique hunting strategy just you know goes one step further to prove that fish is very important to the existence of the fishing cat now which um takes us to the next thing that because fishing cat is unique in the cat family remember there are 40 cat species out of which 38 are mostly land predators except for two which are uh, known to be fish hunters so this makes them unique in the cat family or a species which is evolutionarily distinct in the cat family at the same time they are also uh, categorized as vulnerable by the iucn uh, you know iucn red list um, they are um, so basically they are globally endangered and they are evolutionarily distinct and combining these two factors scientists have come up with an index to identify which species are unique in the tree of life and are threatened and therefore needs therefore is a research and conservation priority this is called the edge index or the evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered index according to this index fishing cats are very highly rated and uh, like i was saying they are actually less studied we do not know much about their ecology just now we have clarified their distribution in the world where they where can we find them um, in recent years we are just starting to count their numbers 
so this is where it all stands there is a lot of natural history there is a lot of ecology of the cat which we still need to know and you know ecology is the science and conservation is actually applied ecology so unless we understand the ecology of the species uh, we cannot really devise conservation strategies or they would be devised on the basis of common sense which might not be uh, so good so coming back then the ecology of the species makes it a global priority for research and conservation if we look then you know it's a national priority too because according to the indian wildlife protection act the fishing cat is a schedule 1 animal which means it shares the same category as the tiger the elephant the lion which also means that it deserves conservation measures of the highest accord in the country so at two levels the fishing cat is a priority species in that sense also you know we are linked to the fishing cat in many ways i'll tell you why because what is that one thing without which we cannot do this is that is water fresh water and fishing cats are indicator of fresh water ecosystem think about the rivers the streams and after that the wetlands which are formed because of that so the earth contains around 0.1% only of freshwater ecosystems which makes them and they can they hold around 10% of uh, the species that we know on earth so imagine these small spaces holding such a lot of species which makes them biodiversity hotspots naturally but which also makes them very vulnerable because it's just this small percentage of land which is holding these communities and so these have become the most threatened ecosystems on the planet and the fishing cat is an indicator of the freshwater uh, ecosystem as well so in in various levels this species is actually a quite a priority and um, if we are able to trace the status of the species we will be able to know we will be able to gain knowledge on what's happening to their community what's what's happening to the ecosystem services or the ecological functions and therefore what might be happening to us in the future now just to tell you that uh, we have heard how tigers can be counted by their natural markings so using a similar method we can also a uh, kind of understand or count fishing cats in the landscapes that they live um and uh i think i had shared a video if it's possible to play that video we can also see how the fishing cat actually fishes is it possible to play the video mm, yes palguni yes i i thanks So these are camera track images, Tiasha. Uh, yes. Where do you put the camera? Yeah, these actually these uh, these are camera track images from Chilika, mm -hmm. where we just concluded a population estimation of the fishing cat, and this was the first time that this estimation was done completely outside protected areas. We have heard about how. you know animals are counted in our national parks wildlife sanctuaries etc mm. but uh, because there is a high chance of you know theft of camera traps when they are kept outside protected areas not many population estimation exercises are conducted in human dominated landscapes so as to speak mm. but uh, very glad to say that you know um in chilika in collaboration with the chilika development authority the forest department and of course local residents mm -hmm. uh, which are mainly comprised of uh, fishermen communities we have been able to estimate their densities and we have found quite a high number of uh, cats in the landscape i'll tell you there is there are around 0.6 uh, individuals per square kilometer um so that i mean around 200 to 300 fishing cats in that landscape which is quite high and it's not very surprising because um we know that chilika has a high diversity of fishes more than 300 species of fishes mm -hmm. and it's 
the fish abundance is so high that it can actually sustain the livelihoods of two lakh fishermen families. Mm -hmm. And we have four fish eating mammals in that landscape, fishing cats, smooth coated otter, Eurasian otter, and the Iravadi dolphin. It just goes to see, goes to show us how fish is at the center of this ecosystem. And because the fishing cats primary prey is fish, uh, we are finding them in such uh, high densities in that landscape. Mm -hmm. So, Functional wet landscapes with natural fish populations uh, is is what is very probably very beneficial for fishing cats. Mm, thanks. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, actually, Piyasa need to uh, stop sharing because for me it's showing that the okay. part is in the share. Yeah. Oh sure, sure, sure. I'll do that. Yeah. So I've stopped sharing. Sure, I'll be doing. Yes, it's done. So, 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 yeah. Just wanted to show participants also yeah. why it's. Good. It's very. Good. And yeah. I will try to show another video, uh, but uh, there are some problems happening at my end today. I'm very sorry, but I'll try to show another video, um, which is which is also very exciting. I hope I can show it. Are you even? So if that showing has started screen sharing, it's not showing anything as of now. Yeah. Now we're showing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's just not working. Yeah, I'm not sure it's showing. So, so basically, I'll tell you these are these uh, vegetation which we are seeing, uh, you know, which is brown in color, is all floating vegetation. And so, I wanted to show you how the fishing cat is kind of balancing on that floating vegetation to try to catch fish. But unfortunately, the video is uh, not really playing. So, I'll go back to our presentation. Yeah, so starting from sometimes these online. <laughs> Things can really become a little problematic. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. we are able to see. Yeah. So, so then where are fishing cats found? So this is actually a predictive modeling. Uh, so we have kind of tried to understand where all uh, fishing cats could occur. And... Uh, you know, the blue areas are where fishing cats are likely to occur in South and Southeast Asia. So the fishing cats global distribution actually starts from the Indus Basin in the West. And then we have the entire Terai Arc landscape uh, flooded by both the Ganga and Brahmaputra. And then we have the Ganges Brahmaputra Basin we have fishing cats there. 
along the eastern coast of india fishing cats are also present in the godav in the in the uh, mahanadi flood plains then the godavari krishna delta is the southernmost population of the fishing cats in india even though the predictive model shows that they are present in southern india uh, in tamil nadu and in the western ghats we have not been able to find them in in tamil nadu and western ghats also do not have fishing cats because we have not been able to um, kind of detect their populations there through surveys that is probably because uh, the western part of india lacks these you know river basins that actually uses this shallow or these these flatter landscapes to form and fan out into flood plains and deltas so probably because of that reason even though the environmental conditions might be good but uh, fishing cats are not there uh, in southeast asia we find them in the um, iravadi delta the salween basin the shao phraya river system the mekong and they might be there in the red river but we have not found them as yet apart from this mainland population fishing cats are also present in sri lanka and in java which are island nations so in effect they are present in 10 countries in the world but recently in the last decade or so we have not been able to uh, detect fishing cats in vietnam and in java so that means uh, that the cat might have become locally extinct or their status is critically endangered in those countries and it's not surprising given how fast we are losing wetlands especially in the asian developing economies um and what we have also seen is that majorly fishing cat populations exist outside the protected area network more than 90% of fishing cat populations are actually present outside our protected areas meaning outside our national parks our wildlife sanctuaries in human dominated landscapes and this is also not surprising because you know our civilizations have grown up along these river basins these river basins are has what has cradled our civilizations and these river basins and their joining wetlands are what fishing cats prefer so fishing cats and humans have always been sympatric and so the protected area centric approach is not going to really work for fishing cat conservation so i also wanted to give you an idea of what type what is this habitat that fishing cats belong to if you see, this is from chilika if you see the you know these tall wet grassland kind of uh, vegetation is where fishing cats actually take refuge these are as tall as 6 feet 8 feet uh so imagine you know an elephant or a dinosaur is, or a dino can easily get um, you know easily hide in 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 this in this sort of a uh, landscape so this is the kind of vegetation that fishing cats prefer dense tall riparian vegetation and the other type of habitat where we find them is the mangrove ecosystem we are all i think much more familiar uh, you know uh, you're much more uh, familiar with mangrove ecosystems for example in sundarbans it's a very good habitat of the fishing cat it also in pitarkanika in the in odisha now um even though 90 per, or more than 90% of its distribution lies outside protected areas um and say in india also it's it's kind of the same thing um they should have really been conserved because we have a very good wetland law according to the wetland conservation management rules 2017 which comes under the environmental protection act all wetlands above 2.5 hectares should be protected but the problem is that it is also said in the law that it will receive protection only if recognized by state or center or if it is designated as a ramsar site we recently had a celebration we have designated 75 ramsar sites in india all that is fine but it's still um inadequate in terms of representing the habitat of these sort of species the problem is that 
state wetland inventories are still in have still inadequately mapped these wetlands so as a result of that the apex court has passed an order recently and the direction is uh, that you know many of these wetlands are still outside the state wetland inventories so the apex court has has said to all states that any wetland above 2.5 hectares should be identified and mapped and included in these inventories um unfortunately um it is still an ongoing process and until and unless this process is completed and these wetlands are inventorized they are practically up for you know they are practically very threatened this is why because according to the ministry of rural development government of india which has published a wet wetland atlas of india many of these wetlands for example water logged areas wetlands are water logged areas and marshy lands are categorized as wastelands and this is the you know guiding government policy for land use change so in the same country you basically have a wetland law which gives protection to wetlands and you have a development law not a law development policy which categorizes wetlands as wastelands and the law supersedes the policy it despite that wetlands are being degraded because they have not been inventorized in the state wetland uh, inventories now the problem is uh, we will we will see what the problem is so for example in the terai which was historically said to be a serious obstacle for human civilization at one point of time in the british era um it underwent rapid conversion for green revolution and as a result now the terai has converted from this malarial jungle which is a serious obstacle for human civilization in 1950s to now which is one of the most densely populated areas in the world and there was a massive expansion of agriculture because of which uh the the wetland grasslands in terai have mostly been converted so this is just an idea of the kind of density of population human population that is there in the area and more importantly in the terai we can see that you know just one person grasslands is protected which means 98% of the grasslands were lost to agriculture and agriculture is one of the intensive agriculture not all forms of agriculture there are certain sustainable forms of agriculture which are not a threat to wetlands but intensive forms of agriculture are, is the number one driver of wetland loss globally as well as in asia and then we have uh, intensive aquaculture which is also a threat because um this you know wetland ecosystem is basically converted into rectangles of just water and monocultured fish and nothing else and as a result of that many of our freshwater fishes are actually very very threatened industries and urbanization is again a major problem especially in uh, developing asian economies and this is all happening because this was not supposed to happen because wetlands are you know are supposed to be protected but this is all happening because wetlands are categorized as wastelands so for example uh, this looks beautiful and this is actually one of the largest contiguous marshland uh, habitat in bengal uh, called dankuni wetlands and also at the center of this longest i mean one of the longest litigation battles in bengal right now there is a battle this litigation going on for the last 12 years to keep companies from usurping this wetland um this is a very um popular birding hotspot for uh, you know in bengal and it is also gives refuge to fishing cats and what we also you know we also when we were contesting or rather when our colleagues were contesting this uh, you know degradation of wetland the common narrative is that development is essential you know it benefits people how will you augment the economic profile of 
uh, local residents if we do not develop. But, you know, we also tried to find out if that was true. And in a recent um, publication, we talked about it. Um, so basically, we tried to ask people, uh, you know, are they really benefiting from this wetland development? Uh, are they really benefiting from industries? What type of links do they have with these wetlands? Um, and with the oral testimonies, we could identify 18 ecosystem services from this Dankuni wetland, which is almost more than 30 square kilometers. You know, we have this um, uh, protected area, in, uh, which is a wetland area, very famous, one of the first Ramsar sites in India called Bharatpur. So Bharatpur is 30 square kilometers and Dankuni is also 30 square kilometers, except that Dankuni is not protected. And by protection, I don't mean protection from local people. I mean protection, we mean protection from these companies who are trying to, to uh, kind of convert uh, this wetland. And people themselves have identified or rather from their oral testimonies, like I said, we, were, we had identified that Dankuni has 18 ecosystem services, which includes food provision, water purification and flood control. And from their own testimonies, they have said that basically this has kind of subsidized their living and this made them less vulnerable to outside economic forces. And we are all very much acclimatized to what happened during COVID when a lot of these rural force was out there in the cities making a living. But when a disaster happened, they all tried to come back. Whereas, you know, people here, they still could subsidize their living because of the of the wetlands. And they said that encroachment of the wetlands by factories and blockage of its riverine connection was degrading the ecological functions over the last 20 years. Now, this is very important that they actually identified that blockage of riverine connection was degrading the quality of the wetlands. And I'll explain why. Think of rivers as the trunks of the trees. So wetlands are connected to the trunk of the tree through the branches and are actually fruits hanging from the tree. So if we cut off the branch, which is connecting the wetland to the river, we are leaving the fruits to die in, for the dearth of nutrition. So this is what is happening to not only Dankuni, but many, many, many wetlands in the lower Gangetic floodplains and in fact, across Asia. Um, so even though this was a very local scale assessment, it had a lot of relevance to what was happening throughout Asia, especially you know, colleagues, my colleagues working on the fishing cat in Cambodia, they were talking about how, you know, this uh, Tonle Sap, which is also a big seasonally inundated wetland area, is being affected because upstream dams in Mekong are reducing the freshwater flow to these wetlands, which is basically reducing the nutrition flowing to the wetlands. And um, in the process, the wetlands are shrinking and it is affecting the rural livelihoods of people who depend on these wetlands for seasonal agriculture, fishing, etc., etc. Now, coming back to Dankuni, interestingly, you know, people who are landless, especially women who were landless and older residents were especially very affected with the wetland loss because they had no other forms or skills uh, to kind of you know earn and uh, the wetlands were kind of making them still lead an independent life and they you know they have identified that you know vested interests are at play vested interests means bigger economic and political interests are at play here and which is actively supporting the degradation of the process of the wetland of the wetland degradation and therefore there is need to make our governments accountable for wetland protection, not because only because it is sustaining biodiversity, threatened biodiversity, or it is, you know, um, or we want to help local residents, not because of only that. It's because wetlands are integral to sustainable, achieving the sustainable development goals that the globe has identified and therefore um and and 
Also for wetland conservation, the normal protected area centric approach where people are actually ousted will also not work because most of them are most of these wetlands are in human dominated landscapes you cannot house people from everywhere rather these are social ecological systems where the society also influences the wetlands the wetlands also influence the society so there is this um, there, there is this way in conserving this wetlands within a socio ecological framework and the good news is that we have these socio ecological frameworks we have um, legal provisions in place to make them work, except that they are less explored. So one of the ways in which this can be done is by declaring uh, areas as community reserves under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act, 1972. And this has to be done in, in um, consultation with local stakeholders where they do not have to really give off their land. Uh, and the other very important and very interesting provision which we have is the biodiversity heritage site provision under the Indian Biological Diversity Act 2002. Now, this provision says that um, if there are traditional ways of managing wetlands, or not sorry, wetlands, but traditional ways of managing natural spaces, which also conserves threatened uh, wildlife species, then these can be categorized as biodiversity heritage sites. And within biodiversity heritage site, there has to be a management plan, which has to evolve by taking into account the perspective of local uh, stakeholders. In fact, they are the ones who can, um, you know, create this management plan in consultation with uh, various other stakeholders, for example, the government, non-government uh, non uh, partners and student and researchers. So seems like a very democratic setup, except that it's not very much explored, uh, even though we have this very promising um, provision. So in the end, I think uh, I got interested in working on the fishing cats because uh, you know, through a, a conversation, it became very clear that fishing cats are linked to wetlands, wetlands are linked to climate change, and climate change is the most important thing affecting our existence. So in a nutshell, whatever happens to the fishing cats will happen to us. This was what got me motivated to work on the fishing cats. And the journey has been immensely fruitful because just by, you know, working on the cat, there is so much of learning and so much of uh, questioning the convention. Um, but yeah, I mean, the wetlands are disappearing very fast since, since I think the 1900s, we have lost almost 70% of wetlands and we are, we are standing at a very critical juncture now um, because wetlands are our food sources. They are our water sources. They are also our carbon sources. So again, it comes down to the fact uh, that, you know, there is this mirror and the fishing cat is standing there and we are standing here and it kind of synchronizes whatever is happening to them is probably what is going to happen to us in the very near future. So with this, I end my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiasha. Uh, this, is, this is fascinating to you know, hear you speak about your efforts and preserving this very rare species and you know and helping us uh, you actually took us to their world and especially that video was very very interesting there's a request that in a way if you can that in a way if you can uh, video uh, Falguni uh, Falguni yes very short and yes. an important video I, actually there's a video where the video. actually there's a video where the cat is Catching a fish, right? The yeah. First one. yeah. Uh, Tiasha, can we play that again? I think one of the requests was. Sure, I'll and, do that. Uh, yeah. and, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Participants yeah. to drop their questions. Participants to drop their questions. I'll take them one by one, but let's watch. I'll take them one by one, but let's watch. So if you look at it, it's a very like uh, it's a very patient cat. It kind of kind of it can sit for hours, like two hours, three hours at a stretch, waiting for the fish to come. 
and then jumping in and catching it so it's really a very it feels like if, even though this is like maybe anthropomorphizing the cat but it feels like it's a very wise patient cat and wise uh, wisdom and patience is probably what we also need uh, right now in our civilization's history the tiasha the camera because where was the camera kept here it looks like it was in the water you had to do yeah, yeah so so basically this is also interesting that uh, you know for catching land cats so as to speak or you know catching these cats which are wild cats which hunt on land we keep camera traps on both sides of a track which is all on land but this is the fishing cat and it hunts in water so we have to use that land water edge so mm -hmm. one of the camera traps is always on the land side and one in the water so because when it's hunting we will have to know i mean one of our objectives is to understand how it hunts and how much it hunts and which which seasons so one of our camera traps always inevitably gets uh, you know kind of installed in the water side of the ecosystem mm -hmm. yes thank you so we have two questions now uh, Anir uh, anirudh is asking do people local communities kill these cats for any reasons i was also had, had a similar because they're competing for the resources so i don't know how big the competition is and you know they so that's the first yeah. so so i think from my experience this has also been very interesting i'll you know i'll explain why in west bengal where there are these private ponds owned by people mm -hmm. there of course there is a, you know concentration of fishes concentration of prey which attracts fishing cats and they predate on it and of course that leads to negative interactions which also includes killing and poisoning but in chilika which is a wet landscape belongs to everybody but nobody it's not a private property it's a common property resource and there we have found no conflict no negative interaction simply because nobody is losing out everybody is catching fish so yes there is um overlap in the kind of resources that fishermen and fishing cats have but it also depends on ownership and uh, when it obviously in that spectrum of community owned or you know common property to private property if it's more towards private property there is a greater chance of negative interactions kicking in especially in landscapes where functional wetlands have been rendered defunct where natural fish populations have uh, become less so obviously in those landscapes there is more probability of fishing cats and fishermen competing for the same resources and that leading to uh, competing for the same resources that humans cultivate uh, that humans own privately and that leads to you know um, an increase in uh, negative interactions but in these functional wet landscapes probably that's not the case but are there any other predators or competitors like for example otters you know fish huh. are there any territorial fights uh, you know naturally because uh, because anil is also asking that sometimes people okay. can misidentify them as tiger cubs and you know maybe collect them or mm. kill so okay. yeah so 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 there are two things here yes uh, there are uh, co predators for example in chilika we have the smooth coated otter we have the eurasian otter and we have fishing cats and we do not i mean fishing cat is so less studied that we have still not got into that sector where you know if there is i mean we are we are kind of in the process of understanding if there is competition over resources between otters and fishing cats because there is a huge overlap in the kind of food they eat which is fish we still not have the answers i'm sorry but hopefully we'll get there mm -hmm. however this uh, thing about fishing cats getting identified as tiger cubs is true the thing is even though fishing cats and humans have probably been sympatric historically but these are cats these are very elusive and so they probably always kind of adjusted to these dense riparian vegetation stayed in inside them and then came out when people were sleeping but when wetlands are fragmented there is a greater chance of humans meeting fishing cats more often 
and because these are elusive less known and I look at i mean see the, their fishing cats are around 15 kilograms in weight and when they stretch they can look like a leopard mm -hmm. so these local residents suddenly one glimpse of the cat in the middle of the night they think oh my god this is a tiger cub it's going to you know whatever i mean there are tigers and leopards in the landscape it's going to take my children mm -hmm. beat it to death that also happens and that is increasing especially in bangladesh bangladesh is a you know fishing cat hot spot because we have this huge uh, ganges brahmaputra basin with all the diversity of wetlands there however there is an increasing tendency to kill fishing cats out of nothing but fear mm -hmm. so that's also there yeah thank you so much thank you goodbye thank you